Rounds and Grand Rounds of 2019, and I'd like to wish you all a very wonderful new year. I have the pleasure of introducing as our first speaker, Dr. David de la Cerda. Dr. de la Cerda is Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care, where he currently serves as the Program Director. He completed internal medicine in University of California, San Francisco, where he served as a Chief Medical Resident. He then trained in pulmonary and critical care medicine in the University of California, San Diego, where he also completed a clinical research year and postdoctoral training. He's um, the author of multiple publications in the field of pulmonary and critical care and also served serves as the principal investigator for multiple funded research initiatives. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. David Balacerba. Hi, how are you? Thank you. So let's start. So I have no disclosure, financial disclosure. I do research, sorry, with some pharmaceutical companies, but that's not be related to anything of what I'm going to talk today. Hello, hello. Now? Yes, okay, good. Okay. So I want to start with the case. So this case, actually, I was in the pulmonary consults. Uh, as an attending, we got this case, 80 years old female. With, I was having this shortness of breath for about a year. She's from Venezuela, came to Miami. Uh, she was diagnosed with pulmonary arterial hypertension back in Venezuela, and she was told pretty much you have a year to live, and then, so sorry, we have nothing else to offer you. They started on Pocentan, which is an older medication. We don't use that much Pocentan anymore in the adult world because we have better medication these days. So I saw her and I said, something is not really pulmonary hypertension. And that's the reason I decided to present this case because there is hope for some of the pulmonary hypertension. Not everybody will be dead five years after the diagnosis. So the patient had a prominent second heart, a half S4, a TR more and more. And she was volume overloaded, like most of your pH patients. She had GVD, hepatomegaly, peripheral edema, and she had this um, more and more in the pulmonary arteries, which I'm going to tell you more in a second. So we start our usual workup for pulmonary hypertension, and I will walk you through in a second how we actually walk these patients for pulmonary hypertension. So as you can see, the PFT was pretty unremarkable. The only thing that it was decreased is your A. Uh, DLCO at 75%, which is less than 80, but your FP1 or your FBC was pretty normal. What is really interesting is the hypoxemia. So she needed three liters resting and six liters walking. For an 18 years old female, that's quite a lot, especially for pulmonary hypertension. When you see your true pulmonary arterial hypertension patients, they don't really are that hypoxemic. They are most of the time not this hypoxemic. CT of the chest show no acute pulmonary embolism. But here you go. This is her VQ scan. We don't get VQ scan that much, so the first call from radiology, you don't know we have CT angiographies now while you buy getting a VQ scan. So remember, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, you do need a VQ scan, the old xenon VQ scan, and it's about the contrast going into the vessels. So let me show you here. So this is the anterior perfusion, and this is the posterior. So this is us looking into the back of the patient. This is us looking in front of the patient. So of course, this will be the heart. But then you start seeing all different defects, multiple defects. Also in the posterior, this is the posterior perfusion. You see multiple defects in the lower lobes, in the upper lobes, consistent with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So at that time with the right heart cath, I want to point out that we show the diagnosis for pulmonary hypertension. The mean pulmonarity was 37. The pulmonary vascular resistance was 50 watts units. Your watch pressure 9, cardiac index 1.5. That is the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, the echo that you can see in this picture, an impressive right ventricle and a small left ventricle. Uh, the RSVP was like 85 on her. So at that time we started the paperwork, let's send her to UC San Diego. Uh, of course I'm biased in UC San Diego, but I do believe this is the best center in the sense they have most of the experience. They have like 5,000 cases and they really know what they're doing. Unfortunately, she cannot be proof because she didn't have any insurance. Just moved from Venezuela, so we have an issue here. I will show you some data at the end, but we start some medications, especially one called Riosiguat, and we start fighting with UCSD to try to get this patient a surgery because it was clear it was a young patient that would benefit from surgery. I want to point out every five years we have this fancy man in Nice. So this is from the really old ones five years ago. There are going to be new guidelines coming this month. And really the big number will be, the mean pulmonary pressure will be 20. But this is the criteria for diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. Mean of 25, wedge of less than 15, and a PVR more, less, more than three. 
It's important to point out, you do need to have a right heart cath to diagnose pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So you get these echoes with severe pH. That is not pulmonary arterial hypertension. That may be pulmonary hypertension. Doesn't mean you do have pulmonary arterial hypertension. What is really the problem in pulmonary arterial hypertension? You have a high flow, low resistance, low pressure system. The same cardiac output going to the left is going to the right. Now when you start having all the diseases, now you have a low flow, but a high resistance, which affect the right ventricle. Now remember, this patient will die from right ventricular failure. They do not die from the pulmonary hypertension per se. So this is kind of what happened. Normally, you can compensate the high pressure. Your cardiac output is maintained. You start developing the disease, increasing your PVR. Your cardiac output starts to decrease. You get to reversible disease, and your cardiac output will drop. And you get your right ventricular failure, and that's what this patient actually died. The work AHL organization classified pulmonary hypertension in five groups. Group number one is the true pulmonary arterial hypertension. Group two is the one secondary to left ventricular failure or pulmonary venous hypertension. Group three is related to chronic hypoxemia, COPD, IPF, ILD, and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, which is the one we are going to talk today. So again, this is all the different reasons why you have pulmonary arterial hypertension. But let's move on to this. So, Around 4% of any acute PE will actually develop to be chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And that's a huge number. I will show you some numbers in a second. Most of these patients actually will have seen those months or years later after the diagnosis. And this is really important. Around 30% of those patients will never remember to have a DVT or a PE in the past. So even if you don't have the story, you may still have chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So this is just to point out, I will show you more in a second. You see there is no, this is a pulmonary angiogram. So contrast is being injected to the pulmonary artery. And you see all the posterior branches of the, of the lower lobe are gone. So you have an acute PE that is in complete resolution. We don't know exactly why some people have some issues with the fibrinolysis systems. There is one mutation called the San Diego mutation that was described in the past. You increase your pulmonary arteries, you develop some arteriopathy of the pulmonary vessels, and then you develop the pulmonary hypertension. Very briefly, the first time it was diagnosed in 1916, 16, that was the first time they described the disease. We go back to Dr. Moser, Kenneth Moser, he was the big guy in San Diego, did the first surgery, and they started describing the procedure. I will tell you more, but remember, this is an endarterectomy, this is a thrombectomy. We're not taking the clot. It's already a scar that is living in the pulmonary vessels. So the problem with this, as the disease progressed, the right ventricle we suffer, so that's why we want to get this patient the sooner the better. So now that the FDA approved medications for CTEF, what we see in all the time is you get this patient referred to us really late. Some of these patients don't even can't get surgery anymore if they are too late in the course. So the symptoms are like any patient with CHF. You have your dyspnea, your extremity, syncope. Remember, 30% will not have no history of IADVT or PE, and you have your pulmonary flow mormos. This is pathognomony for the disease. It's just the, the blood going around the scar tissue inside the pulmonary artery. You have your S2, your TR, and you have, as I mentioned to you, volume of elore, hepatomegaly, ascites, and edema. The prognosis with no surgery is pretty bad, and goes with your, as if you have a mean pulmonary arterial pressure of 15 or more, only survival of 5% in these patients 10 years after. This is again to show you, when you wait for the chronic, for the pulmonary hypertension to develop, these patients die more. So as you increase your mean pulmonary artery, most of these patients actually die by the number nine, by year number nine, I'm sorry. Uh, again, this is to show you that around 4% of the acute PEs actually may develop chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This is different risk factor. So the point is, when you have acute PEs, follow those patients. You should get an echocardiogram, and if you worry enough, you should actually repeat your VQ scan. We have a clinic for PEs. We're happy to take your PEs to refer to us. We will get an echo six months later, a year later, and if we are concerned, we will get a VQ scan in these patients. So if you just think about the numbers, there is around 100,000 acute PEs in the United States. That would be around 4,000 recurrent PEs, around 6,000 some silence period around 2,000. So we have around 12,000 PEs in the United States that can develop to actually chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Only around 300 that operated in San Diego, Duke, the big center. So where is the rest? I just believe we are not doing a good job diagnosing these patients. They may actually be 
dying or being diagnosed with pulmonary arterial hypertension and not getting the correct treatment. Uh, so how that goes? We diagnose pulmonary hypertension in the case of our patient, and I can say her name because she gave me permission. So Daniela, we prepare a package. We send to San Diego a VQ scan, right heart cath. They review the chart. If they believe the patient is a candidate, they invite the patient to go to San Diego. They actually do a pulmonary angiography, and I will show you in a moment. Put contrast in the pulmonary artery, and they repeat the right heart cath, and then the patients get the surgery. Usually, ICU stay about two days or so, like, like Jackson, and then they go back to, to the floor and home 10 days later, two weeks later, they're back home. Uh, so this is the workup for pulmonary hypertension in general. We have the history, the exam, EKG. You get your echocardiogram, and this is more for the house staff, remember. Diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, you need to have a right heart cath. Echocardiogram that is negative, meaning that it's unlikely for you to have pH. But if you do have some evidence of pH, doesn't mean that you do have the pH. So the negative predicted value of the echo is what we're looking. Then you get your VQ scan that we mentioned, you get your PFTs, you have to be sure patient have no hypoxemia, you do your right heart cath. If you do diagnose somebody with CTEF, you need to have a thrombophilia screening. A lot of these patients have actually antiphospholipid syndrome. You also have your elevated factor um, eight, and you may see some mild restriction of PFT and decreased DLCO. So this is a chest X-ray of our patient. What you see here is a decreased perfusion in the lower bases and more increased perfusion in the upper bases as a compensation. So, so again, that's why this is just to compare. So you have your CTEF, as I mentioned a second ago, this is us looking into the patient, so the heart will be here, and this is us looking in the back of the patient with multiple defects, like the one from our patient. The problem is idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. You may also have some decrease in contrast in the periphery of the lungs. So you have to be careful to read your own VQ scans because we don't do many, so radiologists have not that much experience these days. So this is the angiograph that I was mentioning to you a second ago. So they put contrast and you see all this vessel, all this segment is gone. There is no blood flow going to the lower lobe. I will show you a few more cases in a second. So pulmonary angiography is really the gold standard. Every single patient going to San Diego will get this workup. And this is what you see. You may see what we call the punch defects. So if you can see from the arrows, there is no blood going to the lower segments. You see the incomplete obstruction, so there is no flood going to the middle lobe. And then <clears throat> you may also have these webs that you see from the vessel. So it's the, the contrast going around the scar tissue that we have inside the vessels, and this is completely gone as well. Uh, just for differential diagnosis, pulmonary embolism, you will have your piece that looks different from the one before. And as I mentioned to you, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension have a decreased perfusion to the whole periphery of the lungs. In the old days, they used angioscopies. They actually went like you're doing a right heart cath and you see inside with angioscopy. So it's a small camera. Yeah, this is a camera that you can actually see. And the old days, this is the way they were looking the clots and planning for the surgery. Of course, we don't do it anymore. It's not necessarily. CT scan, as I mentioned, is not the way of diagnosing PE, but it's the way to looking for all differential diagnosis. So if you, if you do have a CT, you may see wall thickening of your vessels. That's the one you see right here. You may actually see mosaic perfusion. Of course, you have blood going to a place, and there is no blood going to a different segment, depending on which segment have the CTF. You may also see the intima defect, filling defect, right here. And you may also see this collateral perfusion, which is chronic disease. P will never give you bronchial collaterals. You have to rule out takayasu arteritis, being inclusive disease, like you see in the arrows that is sticking of the septum, which the diagnosis and the treatment is different. And if a patient has history of ablation of the vein stenosis. This is a, a good case, went to San Diego. So you see, this is a nice vessel of the lungs, but there was no lung. It was a, a genesis. That's one of an interesting case. A PA sarcoma, if you look the CT, show like a nice clot in the pulmonary arteries, but it was really a PA sarcoma. Fortunately, that the patient died. And you may also have your right atrium thrombus that you can see in your CT, which it was removed as well and mediastinitis that you can see from histoplasma. So you may see some right ventricular enlargement, dilated pulmonary veins, the mosaic attenuation that I show you, but again, it's not the way of diagnosing, just to show you one of the many studies that we have. So this study, 78 patients with CTEF, proven CTEF, 40 of those, uh, 38 of those actually have a negative CTA, meaning that 
so many, most of the half of those patients didn't have the correct diagnosis. And this is just one that I want to show you. So again, we do need to have a VQ scan every time to diagnose chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Then you have to assess if the patient is a surgical candidate. So you go down in San Diego, they, the surgeons go and see the patient. We know, that's why we don't want to wait, because as the disease progress, you see the pulmonary vascular resistance increases, the mortality, the operative mortality will increase as well. We don't want to wait for patients to get here. We want to send those patients to San Diego here. Actually, the, the new guidelines will say that if you identify chronic thromboembolic disease without the pulmonary hypertension, you should send those patients the sooner the better to, to centers of expertise. Uh, so our patient going back, she finally, we got approved. San Diego have a special funding for this type of patient, so she actually went to San Diego. And she have a cath, similar numbers that the one that we have in Miami, 37 the mean pulmonary pressure, 1.5 the index, and the pulmonary vascular resistance 12 foot units. And this is her angiogram. You have the right lateral, that is all the segments in the lower lobes are gone. And in the left, if you see here, you have also decreased contrast in the left side of the lungs. So the treatment for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is surgery. We know those patients will do well. There are a few medications that are approved by FDA which is an issue because you may start this medication if patients are no surgical candidate. Nobody should be in these medications without being evaluated for surgery. It's a regular open heart surgery. You do a sternotomy, cardiopulmonary bypass, hypothermia. And again, this is a true endarterectomy. We are not removing the clot. This is not an embolectomy. So this is what you see. Most of the disease is this in the distal vessels. Pulmonary arterial hypertension live in the distal vessels of the lungs. It's not this juicy that you see here. It's the distal aspect. So this is what they actually removed during surgery. Uh, they already have 5,000 cases, and again, most of these patients will be out after 10 days. Uh, what is unique from this disease? So the first list that I have, this is any cardiac surgery. You have arrhythmias, bleeding, wound infection, delirium, carrier fusion. These three are unique for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So what is exactly happening here? This is pre-op. You see decreased perfusion in the lower lobes. Patient got the surgery, they removed the clots, mainly in the lower pieces, in the lower segments, I'm sorry. And now you see that the blood flow is going to the lower lobes. Still syndrome, it's still in the blood from the upper, going to the lower, and that will get better. The problem of this is now you have reperfusion lung injury. So most of the blood is going to the lower segments because of the still syndrome, but you have reperfusion lung injury in those segments. So you have most of the blood going to places that we actually get this injury, which act as an ARDS. It's exactly as ARDS, and the treatment is similar to ARDS. High PEEP, low A volume ventilator strategy, position, proning, NO, and you can do actually ECMO in bad cases. Most of these patients do very well after two or three days. And again, this is to show you a higher PVR. We have more issues post-operative after the PVR. Mortality is pretty low, centers of expertise. I'm showing you San Diego statistics, which is less than 1% people dying from surgery. You can also see the change in hemodynamics, which is pretty impressive, from the mean pulmonary pressure, the cardiac index, and the PVR. The actual statistical improvement in these patients. So this is also, you can see from imaging, preoperative and postoperative, the changes in imaging, and also in functional class. But you can see most of these patients can functional class four, and they leave functional class one. It's really interesting that the, the benefits are maintained after 24 months. The hemodynamic changes are maintained, and also the symptoms actually improve. Uh, now, there is, as I mentioned to you, there are some medications for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and be only for three reasons. Bridge to thromboendarterectomy, if you cannot operate these patients, or you have some pulmonary hypertension after the surgery. So one is Riosiguat, a DEMPAS. It was approved a few years ago with soluble guanyl cyclic stimulators. This is the trial that I was, was done to approve. Uh, so improve in both hemodynamics and in functional class in these patients. You see here the difference. So in pulmonary hypertension, when you can walk as far as you can walk, six minute walk distance, you do better. So you see a difference between Riosiguat and placebo. Then they did what they call the chest number two, just to follow long term. And long term after a year, you still have effect of these patients on Riosiguat. The second medication that we know was approved, this is Macitentan. Uh, it was a pretty small study. Only 80 patients were randomized. But actually, this got this medication approved for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension for the three reasons that I just mentioned to you. Uh, 
Finally, the, this Japanese Dr. Matsumura uh, described this. It's like a CAD when you have uh, coronary artery disease. You do angiogram of the pulmonary arteries. You go, you inflate the balloon, and you open the vessels. This is what you can op not operate on these patients. And you can see changes in the functional class, hemodynamic benefits as well. So what happened to our case? This is Daniela surgery. So most of this was in the lower lobes. Finally, at the surgery and a few pieces here. Hemodynamics after six months, we repeat the Raharkat. You see that the pH is gone. She didn't do it so well that she actually is here. Decided to come to conference and listen to the case. So this is Daniela. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. So I want to point out that our program is now at Jackson and UM. So if you have a patient in UM or Jackson, we have a pulmonary hypertension clinic at UM and we have one at Jackson. So if you have any patient you want to send to our way, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary hypertension, please do so. Emilia, which is sitting in front, that's our program coordinator and she will answer any questions if you want to call her. And that's it. Thank you. Wow, David, thank you for that uh, excellent presentation. I'll begin by just asking a simple question. Are there any peripheral markers that are useful in the blood to follow either uh, in diagnosis or in treatment of these patients? For the, we, I mean, if you have, for example, antiphospholipid syndrome, you follow, I usually treat warfarin, so I NR, but that's it. Not for the disease per se. We do, we still use warfarin for these patients. Warfarin, uh -huh. We still follow INRs, a higher INR, about 3.5. But this is after surgery. So there is no other markers you can follow, fortunately. You can follow BNPs, but that's just to see if the RV is failing on you, but that's pretty much it. Dr. Bloomer, first. Um, congratulations. There is a few cases that you have left ventricular dysfunction, but the right ventricular dysfunction give you the symptoms. Okay. Like, like in transplant, when you do CTF or you transplant the lungs, the right ventricle really gets better. It's not like the left ventricle that when it's dilated, it's dilated, the right ventricle really gets better. So that's why the symptoms get... If you already have corporal now, do you still send them for surgery or do you... I still send them for surgery, yes. So that's a good question. So if you look at the questions everybody here. So the question is what happened after 24 months? What about the follow up after 24 months? It's about the patient compliance on the on the anticoagulation. If you have a patient that stopped using and develop new clots, you have new symptoms. So big studies are difficult. Most of the patients, for example, going to San Diego, they, they just refer there. So they go to their home homes. So it's difficult to follow those patients. The one that we have in Miami Three years after, they're doing pretty well. No symptoms, functional class is still one, and they do pretty well. So most of them will maintain their functional class. Joe, doctor, say no. Is there any uh, predictive markers that following up on what Dr. The only marker will be if you follow this patient at six weeks later and they still have a lot of symptoms. That's a case I will follow more closely because six weeks later they should be with no symptoms or really mild symptoms. So it's really symptoms and if they do have hypoxia after six weeks, I will be worried and follow that patient closely. I will not actually do VQ scans before the three months marker because to get enough time for the clots to be dissolved. That's and when, and when do you do right heart catheterization? What are the indications for that? For me, um, so in the, well, I mean, in the, in the community that we live for, fortunately, I do a lot of rahar cats because our echoes are not the best quality. So if I would never diagnose pulmonary hypertension without a rahar cat. So if a patient is sent to our clinic, regardless of the, of the group, we will do a rahar cat. Most of them will get a rahar cat. So anyone with a pulmonary embolus that has what? I mean, what? Okay, okay, I didn't do, sorry. So if you get, if you have symptoms and your echoes still show RV failure, I will do a rahar cat. 
Thank you. Well, thank you very thank much you. for that great presentation. Okay, so it is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Cesar Perez. Dr. Perez is currently an assistant professor of medicine and medical oncology. He received his medical degree in University of Panama and then completed internal medicine residency at Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine in Chicago Medical School, and his last year was in Cleveland Clinic, Florida. He was then our very own fellow here at Jackson Memorial Hospital, where he completed hematology oncology fellowship, um, serving as chief fellow during his last year. Dr. Paris does extensive research in the field of oncology, and he also serves and has served as a sub-PI and PI for multiple funded projects. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Cesar Paris. Right. Um, I'll use the microphone for now, I guess. And again, this is supposed to be the title, but I don't know what happened here. Um, so we're going to talk about refractory thyroid cancer today, um, that it's an all disease with many new weapons. And again, I'm, I'm, I will train here at the University of Miami with Dr. Rosenblatt right there as a chief, and I'm very happy to come to be, in a, be here, be back here. Uh, I came back year and a half ago, and now I specialize mainly in head and neck cancer and thyroid cancers. And thyroid cancer is our, uh, the most common endocrine malignancy, and uh, there's almost half a million patients living with thyroid cancer in the U.S., so it's a very common malignancy. The median age of diagnosis is 50 years, but median age of death for those who die from this disease is under 70s, and that is a clear indication that uh, the patients, this is, uh, they can live with disease for many decades sometimes. So it's considered usually a chronic illness. And for 2008, there were, uh, they calculated that there would be 53,000 uh, cases, of which uh, there's an incidence almost four to one in women compared to men. That being said, even though um, there's 50,000 cases, only 2,000 deaths have been accounted usually per year, and that uh, mortality has been pretty stable over many years. And this is because, you know, thyroid cancer seems to be overdiagnosed within the last two decades. Uh, we're picking a lot more microcarcinomas because we're doing a lot more scans and we're checking more TSH and ultrasound of the neck. So the incidence, although it has almost tripled during the last three decades, and the mortality has been unchanged. Despite this, almost 2,000 patients continue to die every year in the United States because of the disease. And it's uh, considered, uh, it's, uh, it has tripled one percent of all new cancers uh, in the country. So there are several subtypes of thyroid cancer, and right now I'm going to gather four different diseases as one. But we have two main groups, the ones that come from the furicular cells, and one of them is the differentiated thyroid cancer that accounts for 95% of all the thyroid cancers, and the very bad undifferentiated thyroid cancer that is very uncommon or anaplastic, but it's one of the most lethal solid tumors known to men. And from the differentiated thyroid cancer, we have both follicular and papillaries. On the other side, the parafollicular cells is uh, where the medullary thyroid cancers arise, and these are uncommon tumors. Um, that, you know, we are tested in the board sometimes related to red mutations and related to men type 2 uh, familiar centers, but most of them are actually sporadic. So when we talk about 
refractory tar cancer, we usually focus on these four diseases. And in a simplified matter, the uh, tar cancer is usually treated by uh, a surger, surgeons, since surgical resection is the main source of treatment, and then by endocrinologists and Dr. Graham Menendez that is sitting right here, managed most of our tar cancers in the clinic, one of endocrinologists. And in a simplified way, when patients get surgery and they get a tyrodectomy, and after that they get radioactive iodine when it's a differential tar cancer. And they then undergo TSA suppression therapy. And after that, they're monitored for recurrence. And we do have very uh, reliable uh, tumor markers for tar cancer. We have teraglobulin for differential tar cancer, and we do ultrasounds and also calcitonin for medullary tar cancers. But unfortunately, around 15% of all the patients will have recurrence. And sometimes this recurrence might be minimal when there's only a teraglobulin increase. And sometimes we can actually uh, do a radioactive iodine scan and treat with ra radioactive iodine when uh, appropriate. Or if the recurrence is extensive with, for example, long metastasis, we can, the first question is, can this be resected or not? And sometimes resected, resection is amenable and patients will undergo resection. But when the resection is not amenable and the, uh, the patients have, don't have a radioactive iodine and AV disease, this is what we actually call a iodine refractory tar cancer. And this is when medical oncologists get involved into the treatment of the disease. So we gather this disease in three groups. One of them is the right refractory differential tar cancer, both papillary and follicular. And a different disease that is treated differently is the recurrent or metastatic medullary tar cancer that is always, you know, right refractory because the powerful cancer, there's no iodine there. So it's always iodine refractory. And the very bad anaplastic tar cancer. So when the tumor becomes right refractory or metastatic, then the prognosis becomes a lot worse. Historically, these patients are patients that live between 36 to 48 months. And from a plastic tar cancer, most of the patients die within six months of diagnosis. So the question is, right, you know, does, can, does chemo work for this? And chemo can actually shrink some tumors. Um, doxorubicin, a single agent, has a response rate of 36% or one third, one third of the patient can actually respond. And doxorubicin was approved actually 30 years ago for tar cancer based on this. Unfortunately, with a lot of toxicity, and also uh, with a short-term response, response rates. We can use doxorubicin with cisplatin, also with a similar response rate, but also short leaf and with a lot of toxicity. So I think before we go into talking about partial response and progression-free survival, since uh, you guys, most of you don't do oncology, I think we have to just try to explain what exactly we're talking about. So how much shrinkage is enough shrinkage, right? We do, we do a trial, we give a patient some drug, how much is good enough? And you will open a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine every two weeks about oncology, and you have like, you know, what exactly are they talking about? Now you will say that the response rate was, for example, on this one, it was a couple of months ago, 75%. And what exactly that means? You know, I think that's the first question for you guys, right? Um, how much is shrunk? How much is good enough? You know, it depends on the malignancy, it depends on the patient. But we have to draw the line somewhere. And in oncology, we draw the line and we call this, uh, in something called response evaluation criteria for sorry, tumor, we call it resist. So when you open a paper of oncology and you'll see that the response we evaluated by resist is some criteria specifically we have to know how much shrinkage is good enough and where we draw the line so we can compare it to another treatment, right? Um, so the, we gather the response in four different categories when all the tumor goes away that we call the patient had a complete response, obviously. If we sum the diameters of some lesions and when that sum decreases by 30%, then we call that this a partial response. But if the tumors increase more than 20% or the target lesions that we should increase more than 20%, then or there's a new lesion, then the patient, we call it that the patient progressed. And if the tumor kind of stay the same between minus, uh, plus 20 or minus 30, then that's what we call stable disease. And for example, you know, radiologists will do a scan at the beginning before you start treatment, right? We give the patient therapy and then we repeat the scan a couple of months after. And if somebody has two liver lesions, one of them is six centimeters, the other one is four centimeters, so we know the baseline sum is 10. And then we get some treatment and they go from four and two. So now it's six in the repeat scan. So that's what we call a partial response. So now when we, you read you know, a paper and we're talking about response, now you know exactly what, what this means. And we can gather, for example, overall response rate is complete response for partial response, or clinical benefit is complete for partial response and stable disease. Because if the patient is asymptomatic, he's doing good with therapy, and the tumor is not growing, it still is benefit clinically, right? 
the same goal for overall survival, and you guys use this in, you know, in many trials in critical care, you know, that is the time, the medium of survival, the time when the treatment starts until when half of the patients actually are expected to be alive. And then progression of survival is something used mostly in oncology, that is when we start treatment, right, until the time when half of the patients are alive and have not progressed. Because if we shrink the tumors and the patient dies, that's not really good, right? Um, so we want the patient to be alive and without disease progression. And this is one of the trials I'll talk about in a few minutes of cabosatinib that is an agent approved for medullary cancer, where the progression of isobab I'll mention is 11.2 months versus four months for placebo. So you go here in the median, right? And then you go here, and then you know that the 50, the median progression of isobab, right, when half of the patients were alive, was actually 11 months compared to placebo, where it was just four months. So you only, when you look at the complementary course, you can make an assumption. You don't even have to look at the numbers. And they say that if you can put a pointer in between the two curves, then it's clinically significant, right? <laughs> Simplify away. All right? So going back to where exactly, you know, can we do something better than chemo for thyroid cancer, right? And so we know now for the last 30 years that there's many driver mutations that are present in some thyroid cancers. And the one that you guys have heard the most is the red mutation because it comes in many type 2 syndromes and is present in most of the medullary thyroid cancers. And also, RET, uh, that is radiation transfection, can have a rearrangement with the PTC protein that can be present in differentiated thyroid cancers. And more commonly, there's also BRF mutations in differentiated thyroid cancers, up to 40% of them that we can target. And this is important because we actually have kinase inhibitors for all these abnormalities. So the most common genomic abnormalities in papillary is BRAF, right? But you can have a red PTC rearrangements too. Uh, so we can use red inhibitors in papillaries too. Follicular can has a RAS that we're still working on and blocking RAS uh, mutations, but some of the uh, other uh, kinase inhibitors can work well in follicular thyroid cancers too. And medullary, as you well know, familiar medullary, most of them actually had a red mutation. And of these sporadic cases, at least half of them also had a red mutation so that we can actually use red inhibitors. So these are all how we talk, you know, red can go down into the BRAF pathway, and red also goes directly to PI3K, and it's very important to uh, remember that thyroid cancers can overexpress the vascular arterial growth factor receptor, and therefore inhibitors of the vascular arterial growth factor receptor can also uh, have activity in thyroid cancer. So... In general, in the two large groups of thyroid cancers, in the medullaries, we know they're always very resistant because they don't express iodine. They're usually red mutated. The overall survival at 10 years for all the population is 80%, but that means around 20% of the patients actually become metastatic and die. And we do have good serum markers as CEA and calcitonin for it. On the other hand, different thyroid cancer cancers that most of them are cured, but 5% of them can die from their disease at 10 years. They usually are right avid, at least initially for most. BRAF and red PTC mutations are the most common genomic abnormalities, and 95% of them actually are alive at 10 years, but that means that from that big uh, amount of patients that are diagnosed with papillary thyroid cancer, 5% actually die from their disease. And the best uh, tumor market is um, thyroglobulin that you guys are familiar with. So in the first group, going to right differentiated, uh, right refractory differentiated thyroid cancer, two drugs has been approved for this disease to the left is the registration trials of lenvantinib, that is an oral multikinase inhibitor against BEFR, 1, 2, 3, also red and KIT. And this is the SELECT trial. There is a randomized phase 3 trial of lenvantinib versus placebo for patients with progressive differential thyroid cancer, where almost 300 patients were randomized on a 2 to 1 uh, ratio to lenvantinib versus placebo. Importantly, crossover was allowed progression. So when the patients were on drug and they didn't in placebo and they worked and didn't and they progressed, then they, they actually got lenvantinib a progression. A similar trial was uh, published a little bit earlier in Lancet. That is a decision trial for sorafenib. That is a little weaker inhibitor, older inhibitor, but it's actually also effective. Uh, also a phase three trial, almost 400 patients randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio. Also crossover allowed a progression. And these are the survival curves. As you see to the left, lenvantinib, you know, although we, do, we should never do cross-trial comparison, but just for the fun of it, you can see on the left that the benefit from lenvantinib is a lot larger with a progression for survival, right? The time from the, when they start treatment until they die or progress, it was 18 months, so a year and a half compared to three months. The overall response rate, that is res partial response plus complete response, was 65%, and at least 
81% of the patients actually had a benefit from the treatment. So the patients actually on placebo, most of the time they died or progressed within four months, okay, compared to Lembantrip. In the other trial with Serafinib, that is the only other agent that is approved, these are oral agents. So the IPS, Serafinib, Lembantrip, they're always pills, right? And the MAPs are always parenteral, right? The uh, monoclonal antibodies. So Serafinib also, uh, with a significant improvement in progression of survival, but it was not a strong 10.8 months versus 5.8 months. And the response rate is a lot lower, it's 20% at least in that trial. So although you should never do cross trial comparison, there's an obvious benefit of lembantinib over serafinib in, in the clinical setting. So two agents approved lembantinib uh, and serafinib. These are pills, but that doesn't mean they're not toxic. They do have their own toxicity and their streaming related adverse effects in 30% of the patients. Because they block the BGFR, the vascular integral factor receptor, they can have hypertension, proteinuria. Also, they can have QT prolongation in 8% of the patients, patient, I'm sorry, and diarrhea. So it was approved in 2015. On the other hand, serafiny with similar adverse effects um, with a lot lower response rate, um, but it's still approved also for the disease. And we usually use this sequentially. If somebody gets lembantinib but doesn't work, then we move to serafiny. So for the other disease, that is medullary artery cancer, when it becomes metastatic, we also have two drugs. One of them is bandentanib, and the other one is cabosatinib. Bandentanib obviously targets red and also BEFR, and cabosatinib targets also red and BEFR and MET. Bandentanib was, uh, also, was stood in this double-blind phase two trial on 300 patients too. The difference between the two trials in the trial with bandentanib, the crossover was allowed, the trial with cabosatinib, the crossover was not allowed. But the most important difference is that patients with medullary artery cancer, sometimes they can live for three years without progressing. They can have lung meds, liver meds, and their tumor is not growing. Um, those patients were not included in this trial, but they were included on the other trial. And that's very important because although both trials showed an improvement in progression of survival, the thing that we learned most on this trial for patients with medullary artery cancer is that some patients on the placebo arm you can see here, actually, the progression of fissure was 19.3 months, different with the trial with cabosatinib, that it was four months. So obviously, without any treatment, they took them a year and a half to progress. So I think the thing that we learned from this trial, that with medullary cancer, we have to really select the population that really requires treatment. But certainly, both drugs were better placebo, and at the end, patients with uh, mutation positive, they also um, have a even greater benefit with uh, both agents, including cabosatinib. So two agents approved, both pills, both with uh, their own adverse effects. They are less toxic than chemotherapy, but it's still they have 30% or more adverse effects, including diarrhea, rash, hypertension, QT prolongation, monotor SATs, and also GI hemorrhage because they do block the vascular integral factor. We were approved a couple of years ago, um, and, and they're available uh, commercially. So we have to know for medullary cancer, we only treat patients when the tumor is growing. So the fact that a patient has a metastatic disease doesn't mean that they actually need you know, one of these agents. And there's two drugs approved, both with improved progression of survival, both with severe adverse effects in 1% to 8%, and in general, at least mild adverse effects in up to 40%. But this drug doesn't work forever, and we know that because they are such promiscuous drugs, they inhibit several different kinases, so they have several different adverse effects. And we're now developing um, two different new inhibitors for red, um, for medullary cancer. They are very effective in patients with red positive tar cancer, both DTC and medullary, with the response rate in patients that were actually treated already with the other agents that go up to 70% and a clinical benefit close to 90%, and we have one of these uh, trials open here at University of Miami um, with state patients enrolled so far. I think we're number five globally enrolling in these patients. And the most important thing is that they're less toxic. And this is the waterfall response plot. You can see this is how much the tumor shrank, and most of the patients actually have tumor shrinkage with the new agents. So lastly, for anaplastic tar cancer, they are always considered stage four. This is probably one of the worst malignancies uh, that we that the men develop. Very chemo and radio resistant, and the five year overall survival is only seven percent. So ninety three percent of the patients die within five years. But recently, we did notice that um, twenty percent of the patient can have a BRAF mutation. So, and it's the same BRAF mutation is present in melanoma. So they did a small trial of twenty six patients with anaplastic tar cancer. And in the 22 available patients, 
the response was 61%, and this is a lot more than everything that we had, with a one-year overall of 80%. So based on this small trial, and probably you wouldn't see this very often, that based on less than three patients, the FDA actually granted accelerated approval to this of this combination of dabrafenib trametinib for patients with thyroid cancer. And, and it was approved this year for this anaplastic thyroid cancer, the such a difficult disease. So if you ever actually see a patient in the hospital with this disease, um, we have to move fast. This, this can actually literally kill patients within weeks after diagnosis. But the brafin and trametinib, it seems to be very effective for this specific subset of patients. So since the 70s, endoxorubicin was approved, and for 20 years we had no advances. But we did discover that red PTC was rearranged in the 80s, and then the red mutation was discovered in uh, men type 2 in the 90s. And they developed the first red inhibitor in the year 2000. And then we did many trials, phase two trials in the late 2000s. And for the last eight years, then six different agents had been approved for the treatment of refractory thyroid cancer. And now the survival that was before three to six years usually is estimated to be around eight to nine. So there's a paradigm shift in the treatment of this disease now. And we have two agents, bandentanib and cabosatinib, that are approved for progressive medullary thyroid cancer and also two agents that are approved for differential thyroid cancer, but we have to always remember we only treat these patients when the disease is actually progressing or if they are symptomatic. For anaplastic thyroid cancer, dabrafenib and trametinib for is very effective when they are BRAF mutant. And despite this, we're developing very effective selective red inhibitors that we have actually available in Sylvester, and we have patients that are coming from MD Anderson and Moffitt just to be treated under this trial. So as always, in oncology, primum non nocere, I think this is the first thing we, the fact that a patient has a metastatic disease doesn't mean that the patient is treatment, but when they need treatment, we do have very effective options for them. So thank you very much. Thank you for that update on this relatively uncommon uh, condition. Um, when, uh, in breast cancer, for example, when there's a metastatic lesion, one has to biopsy the metastatic lesion to be sure the markers, the genetic markers, haven't changed very much from the primary. In thyroid cancer, when you notice a metastasis, oftentimes the, pr the primary is found in the thyroid, but sometimes not. And so do you go ahead and biopsy at least one of the metastatic lesions to be sure that you're dealing with the same genetic abnormality as in the primary? We try. We try to always metastasize. It's not always feasible. And in, in breast cancer, the receptors change in 15% of all the patients, and that's what we try to biopsy. But then how much it changes the mutation status? We don't know, but we always try to biopsy the metastatic cell because we know that's the clone that is actually spreading on the patient. So yes, we try to do it, although it's not always feasible. Well, thank you, everybody, in both our oh. groups. Oh, there's a question. Yes. To oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Hanush is one of our endocrinologists here. She also sees a lot of thyroid cancers in our clinic. And I, Dr. Hanush, there, is a, there was a trial with selumetinib that is a MEK inhibitor um, that proven that patients that were radioactive refractory, they actually regained sensitivity to iodine. Okay. It hasn't been studied after that in a large setting, but we do have several MEK inhibitors that are commercially available. Trametinib is the most common one that we use. That is the same one that is effective with, um, with uh, dabrafenib for rare mutated. So it's not, it's not, it hasn't been studied after that small trial, I can be honest, although we do have MEK inhibitors available. And one of the things I was discussing with Dr. Gra last time is that we, probably studying the sensitivity of patients that have a BRAF mutation and they're already on trametinib to see if they regain sensitivity to iodine probably will be the next step. Since they've already been treated with a MEK inhibitor anyways, so that's probably an easy thing to do. Just wait two months, recheck their uh, iodine uh, diagnostic scan to see if they regain sensitivity. But on trials, there hasn't been more information. On that. And that's, you know, enzalometin is not approved, the one that actually proven to do that. But we can certainly do that on the clinical setting now because some patients actually receive and make inhibitors anyways. 
Okay, thank you very much. For thank you. <laughs> you. You said one thing at the beginning, which I want to be sure you didn't mean. The frequent measurements of TSH have nothing to do with cancer. The frequent measurement. I mean, you said we measure. We get a lot of imaging studies, and we measure TSH. Oh no, no, no! We have to do cancer. No, we we do screening for patients. We do a lot.